Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is a very special episode 50 of the podcast called An Eagle's Eye View with Dr. Eve Ely. It's difficult for me to describe the impact that Eve Ely has had on the coral profession. In fact, it might be impossible to quantify. He has cultivated the passion to teach and conduct in multiple generations of young teachers, and he's impacted thousands upon thousands of singers in his honor choirs that he's directed around the world and his own choirs, graduate students, and everything in between. So let me try to illustrate it with an anecdote, just how the how the impact of his inspiring way of teaching and his inspiring way of helping people see themselves as being very connected to humanity through music has affected my life and my family. So he was my teacher uh, in the late 1990s, right before he retired. And so there's an obvious connection, but he was also the Allstate clinician in South Dakota when my mother was a student in high school in the 1970s who she was then inspired to become a choir director, which led to me even being a choir teacher and going to see Dr. Ely at UMKC in the 1990s. Meanwhile, in Idaho, before I had ever even met my wife, Dr. Ely is heading out there to work with choirs at Idaho State, where he inspires her to come to Kansas City to work on her master's degree. If she hadn't come there, she and I never would have met. My kids wouldn't exist. (laughs) So when I say that I owe this man a lot, I mean a lot. In this episode, Dr. Ely and I discuss the changes he has seen in the choral profession over the decades, as well as what he has seen as staying the same. We discuss his philosophy of education and where he sees music fitting into that philosophy. We also discuss the concept of teachers being models of curiosity rather than the source of answers for students and so much more. It's just a a fantastic conversation uh, also held here in my home studio where we really got to kind of dig in on a personal level uh, to, to his life and thoughts. So stay tuned for that. Before we get to Dr. Ely, just want to throw out some announcements and some thank yous. You can head to Patreon patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy if you appreciate the content that we produce on this show. This show is entirely listener supported, uh, meaning, despite what you might think, not a corporate sponsored podcast. Here's what I mean by that. All the content's free. If you don't choose to support on Patreon for $3 a month to chip in for the private podcast feed over there or the extra content that I produce over there for you, Uh, Or if you don't choose to go to one of the sponsors of the show and use the promo code, I don't get paid anything. So all the success and all of the help that you provide by doing that makes this show possible. Whether you're sharing the episodes, whether you're liking or commenting or being part of the conversation, sending in your suggestions, Patreon, using the promo code, all those things are how this show exists. And so we're entirely listener supported here. And I appreciate the audience very, very much. At Patreon, we do have a producer level, so I'm going to shout those folks on uh, out. Uh, we are produced at Patreon by Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. Also, of course, it is not too late to get your Sight Reading Factory memberships for you and your students. It's a crit. Many schools are going back online or, or pulling back out of the classroom right now in the winter. Uh, Or uh, if you're in person, either way, that's the great thing about Sight Reading Factory. There are tools to use there that are customizable for every level of choir. And it's keeping my kids going with their weekly reading and that that skill continues to grow. So you can go over there and sign up for you and your students and get 10% off every time you use Coralosophy at checkout. Also, there is the Resonance Singer's Mask. If you are fortunate enough to get to be in a place that can sing right now, that means the Resonance Singer's Mask is a great tool for that. Uh, My kids are loving it. Uh, You can find it at mymusicfolders.com. You can also get a discount there for using Coralosophy at checkout, but also if you need choir folders, choir robes, and a bunch of other gear that they have there, you can use that code as well. Last but not least, we have the convention in Atlanta coming up in April. Uh, We're being optimistic that there's going to be a vaccine and the virus is going to be less uh, frequent by then and it'll be safe to get together in a small socially distanced convention of uh, some awesome professional development we've got lined up. We've got Maria Ellis will be there, Ryan Main will be there, Uh, we'll have Jacqueline Johnson there, Jaron Jorgensen will be there, 
as well as Christy McLean. And we'll be doing sessions that are different than the type of sessions that you think of normally, rather than a presenter just talking at you, it'll be more of sitting down in, in groups and having discussions with a leader on that topic. Uh, we'll be doing topics like choral yoga, mindfulness, teaching and assessing literacy, rehearsal style, uh, kind of reading sessions, building the inner musician, finding your definition of excellence, instructional, instructional technology, leading an inspiring rehearsal, uh, and many, many more things crammed into a weekend. So head over to choralosophy.com forward slash choralosophy hyphen con, or there's a choralosophy con 2021 Facebook group that you can join for more information about that. Okay. So I know that the reason you're all here, of course, is to hear Dr. Ely and I chatting about life and about philosophy and about teaching choral music. So I'm going to bring you straight over to that interview. Enjoy. All right, well, I'm here with Dr. Eif Ely. Uh, Eif Ely, many of you pro probably know, uh, is a intergenerational choral legend, uh, which, uh, and, and of course, uh, some of you might not know, was one of my teachers when I was uh, a young person back in 1998. I met you, and you made a big impact on my life. And one of the uh, things that I thought I'd start out by mentioning here for this little chat is that the show is, this, this show is called Choralosophy. Ah, I like it. Yes, and and of course, uh, my uh, attachment to injecting philosophy into the way I teach choral mm -hmm. music was very much inspired by you. Mm, thank you. Uh, yeah, of course, and that's something that you talk a lot about, uh, and you talked a lot about when you were on the podium with mm -hmm. us. Is that there's always got to be a why? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to we have to figure out why we are singing this. Why are we doing it this way and not this way? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was such a I think some of my best memories from uh, from singing in your choirs was, yes, the music was great, but was also the times we would stop and talk about why. Oh, uh, and so, so just so you know that the uh, that lives on in this show. Oh, you know, we, thanks, that's Chris. Where, that's yeah. good. So I appreciate you <laughs> being here and coming out yeah. to talk with me. Uh, so why don't you uh, first tell everybody, uh, just kind of walk us through... Uh, what your life as a choral director has been like, and, and I know lots of people know this story, but we might be introducing some people to you that have never uh, heard your story before. Um, your, your, your journey from being a young person uh, to deciding that you wanted to do this mm -hmm. for your life, and just mm -hmm. kind of give us the, you know, the bullet points of what you've done throughout your life in choral music. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I... Uh... I'm kind of amazed myself that I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, considering the background, because I grew up on the farm, as you've probably heard me mention a number of times, from a big family of 13 children. And uh, I, uh, I was one of the very few in our community that got to go to high school. Uh, it was a German farming community, and back in those days, they hadn't passed a law yet that said you had to be in school until you were 16. So a lot of the boys didn't even go to high school. But my papa, I guess, thought maybe I should uh, I should give that a try because I was kind of skinny and scrawny and there were too many other kids to farm. So I not only got to go to high school, and a college didn't even enter my mind because that's something no one else in my family ever did. And then uh, a couple of weeks after high school graduation, a couple of weeks before uh, the fall semester, a local uh, a director came out from, uh, uni which is now University of Nebraska at Kearney, Bill Lynn, he was the choral director, came out and, and talked to my dad and uh, said, we, wanna, we want this kid in our school. And so two weeks later, I was going to university and there was this thing called registration, and he said, you just fill out everything you can, and, and down here where it says major, put down music. <laughs> and I did. Um, so I majored in music. I played tuba in the band, string bass in the orchestra, sang in the choir, and uh, minored in speech and drama, because it was just things I, I loved to do. Mm -hmm. And even then, when I graduated from college um, that summer, I was fairly high on the draft. They were still drafting young men, and <clears throat> I was supposed to go in about December. And I thought, well, I'll work for my dad this summer, and then when it's time for me to go to the service, I'll do that. 
Again, two weeks before school started, the superintendent in Western Nebraska called and uh, said, we, we need a choral director and a drama teacher. Would you come out and interview? Oh, that's kind of a surprise. Well, okay, I'll give it a try. But I said, I am supposed to be drafted here in a few months. And he said, well, we'll take care of that. <laughs> so somehow he did. And so I got my first high school job out in Panhandle in Nebraska. And I, I guess it just sort of, sort of uh, fell into it. I mean, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved teaching music, but it was... It was still not a job, really, for me. Just something that I did, and and so I went never, from you, there. You didn't really set out then, at, in your college years, that you hadn't really dreamed of a career as a music teacher, or and so you kind of backpedaled into it in, in I, a way. Yeah, I I don't think so. I I mean, I knew something about being a music educator, but I didn't really have any leadership that said, this is, this is what you're going to do. And this is Got what I, I didn't plan that far ahead. Uh-huh. Right. And um, the, what, what amazes me is I've never interviewed for a job that I got. Every single position I've had sort of came my way. Mm -hmm. That first time they called me, I hadn't, I hadn't sent out any applications. I got that job, small town, Bayard, Nebraska, and uh, three years later, uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, which was a class A school, uh, the superintendent called and said, hey, we'd like to have you come up and interview for this job. So I got that high school job, and I, I loved high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then Warner Imick, the dean of the University of Colorado, came out and said, uh, we'd like to have you come over to our school. To, uh, well, by then I had gotten my master's at Peabody in Nashville, Tennessee, and then uh, he said, we'd like to come over to Colorado. We'll, we'll pay for your tuition and your books, and uh, you'd give it a try. So I went to the University of Colorado, got my doctorate, and I, about middle of August, once again, two weeks before school started, I got a call from the University of New Mexico. They wanted me to come down, interview for the job. I didn't even know they had a position. I was... Doug McEwen was there. He was a pretty big name. Uh -huh. And um, so I got the job at the University of New Mexico, trying to make a go of it there. Uh, I was not terribly happy with that situation, but I was going to make the best of it. And then they called me at the conservatory in Kansas City, and I thought, well, I don't know. Who wants to live in Kansas City? In my opinion, Kansas City was <laughs> it had to be the armpit of the nation, you know. But I came out, and they put me up at the, uh, what is now, uh, the Intercontinental Hotel down by the, overlooking the plaza. And mm -hmm. I thought, this is a lot nicer than I expected. And so I got the job at the conservatory and, and it was the right place at the right time. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer. I just think the good Lord has always been in charge of my life and uh, has led me down this path and thoroughly enjoyed it. That's, that's, an, that's an amazing story. and the, uh, j So just for frame of reference, the New Mexico transition to then Kansas City, what, what years are we talking about there? 1972. 69 to 72, I was in uh, New Mexico. I came here in 1972. Okay. I, I love Kansas City. I just think it's a really wonderful place. It's, it's comfortable. It has everything that we, we enjoy. It's got a really uh, live art scene, and uh, of course, a lot of choral activity, mm -hmm. <laughs> including yours. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's it's been a good life. Yes, yeah, I, we love Kansas City too. I, I have no plans of leaving, and it's funny that you mentioned that one of those lifestyle things is just having access to country. Mm -hmm. uh, which it's, it's nice because I feel like Kansas City is, uh, this is not a commercial for Kansas City, but uh, that one, one of the things I like about it is that I feel like it lives kind of in, a, in the middle where I can get, and my, get my family out of the city into the nature yeah. and, and get into a little bit more of a rural setting very easily. But then with a 20 minute drive into the city, we can have all those things that you just mentioned, right. all those, that, that arts stuff. Uh, so it's not, it, and it's spread out enough where it doesn't feel like we're crowded into each other, which 
has been helpful during the pandemic as well. Yes. Um, I remember talking to, I've had friends that, um, you know, live in, live in New York City and just in awe of the fact that I could leave my house, get all the way to the grocery store and all the way to the milk aisle of the grocery store and, <laughs> and never really bump into anyone. Right. Um, which, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's just the way our life is here. So, and, and don't forget, yeah. Chris, uh, we have the Super Bowl champions. Too. That's true. <laughs> yes, that's very important. That's very important. So, okay. So we've, we've gotten then from uh, kind of your, your younger years and, and then into the, the, your days as a collegiate uh, choral director. Has, has this philosophy that, we, that I was mentioning before, this kind of uh, discussing with your choirs, uh, asking questions, talking about why, uh, all of those types of things. Was that something that you feel uh, was part of your, your personality that then came into the choir room? Or was it something that, you, that was something that uh, developed from your, your choral rehearsing methods and then spilled out into your personality? Does that make sense? Or... Yes, uh, I can tell you exactly where it started. When I was still teaching in Scotts Bluff High School, uh, you know, the job's very taxing. Mm -hmm. And I gave 100% and it wore me out. So after six years, a total of nine years of public school teaching, I thought, I can't do this anymore. I was physically and emotionally kind of a wreck. And uh, I was offered the opportunity to go into real estate and insurance. And so I thought, I think that's what I'm going to do. I didn't sign my contract. And then uh, my voice teacher was uh, George Lynn. He, he was in Denver, Colorado. He, he had been a former director of the Westminster Choir College. And uh, he was feeding me a lot of philosophy. And he said, if before you give this up, he said, I want you to come and hear the master himself, John Finley Williamson. John Finley Williamson was doing a workshop, a three-week workshop at Denver University. And so I told my wife, maybe this is what I should do before I give it up. And I went to that workshop and it changed my, it changed my life. I mean, it certainly changed the direction of my life or didn't change the direction. It kept me on course right. because his, was, his philosophy was so powerful that I thought this is the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. I had, to, I had to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, not just how. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been talking about that ever since because when we teach, um, there are two aspects, why and how. And how has always been more popular in every part of society. We have is books, libraries full of books that tell you how to do this and that and everything. And it's very important because um, we have, uh, the how is a methodology that changes. It's continually changing. And to be a good teacher, you have to change with the times. And so uh, you, you need that to, to recharge your batteries. And that's why we go to summer workshops. That's why we have, have conventions and we're constantly recharging our batteries. But that's just for the short range that gets you over the, the little humps, but the long range to keep you motivated as to why I'm doing this, why becomes much more important. Mm -hmm. And also what I love about philosophy too is philosophy doesn't change. Methodology changes, philosophy does not change. Good philosophy doesn't change. And so I am, mostly concerned about uh, the why of music. Mm -hmm. And I think this is lost with our generation because ever since the advent of the recording industry, um, uh, people have been too, too intensely involved in performance, uh, just looking to go from one concert to the next and seemingly getting all the gratification just from that performance. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not what music was intended to do or be. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I read what Martin Luther said, uh, that little line, next to the word of God, music is the greatest gift. It controls the heart, the mind, the body, and the spirit. That really struck home with me. I sincerely believe that that it is truly an amazing gift. And all the ancient philosophers have felt it was a great gift. Uh, the greatest minds 
uh, like, um, I like what uh, Albert Einstein said, the greatest mind of the 20th century. He said, the most gratifying thing a human being can experience is the mysterious. He said, and the power of music is one of the most mysterious things, greatest mysteries in life. He said, it's right up there with the love of God and the immeasurable universe. That tells me it is really a very powerful gift yeah. for human beings. And the old ancient philosophers also felt that uh, they were always, uh, like Plato and Aristotle, they were always trying to determine what makes a good person, a well-functioning human being. To be well-functioning, he has to be able to communicate, so we teach him language. He has to be able to calculate, so we teach him mathematics. But they also respected the fact that there's a third dimension to the human being which is equally important to the mind and the body, and that's the spirit, the soul, the part of you that lives, that continues to live, and that has to be fed. And that can best be served through this great gift of music. <clears throat> I'm talking more, too much. No, you're, this you're absolutely, <laughs> that's exactly, yeah, no, so it's more than just a vocation that those of us who uh, our music teachers sign up for for a paycheck. It, mm -hmm. It's it, it's it's not, um, and and I would even say that in the school setting or when we're working with kids and introducing them to music for the first time, uh, it's more than just a subject to study. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, there's there, you, like you mentioned, that there is a methodology, and that that part of the methodology might might fall into that category of the subject to study, mm -hmm. but then but there is a uh, a deep connection that happens between the people who are making the music together that is that that mystery I, I i was thinking when you were talking about einstein just now and what he had said i i have a great little story short story about a student i once had who um kind of like einstein just this gigantic brain right kid mm -hmm. who came in probably iq of 185 maybe was the smartest kid in the building including mm -hmm. all the teachers whenever he was there and he took choir. He didn't start taking choir till his junior year. And uh, of course he was very smart, so all of the, the mechanics, the methodology you might say, he was able to pick up very quickly. You know, mm -hmm. once I explained him, to him how to read the music, he could get that no problem. Uh, when I would, you know, teach him the terminology, he could get that no mm -hmm. problem. But as far as getting his voice to sound beautiful, Mm -hmm. That was very hard for him. Mm -hmm. And his senior year, he took the choir, took choir again, tried out for my top group, and he wasn't really quite good enough in terms of uh, the vocal mechanism to make mm -hmm. the group. But I put him in anyway because you got to have as many smart kids in a good <laughs> choir as you possibly can. <laughs> right. And uh, by the time, uh, one of my proudest moments as a teacher was when he decided to write a letter to the principal. Um, he was ended up being he was going to be the valedictorian of the class, but he ended up falling to salutatorian because he took choir because oh. it, it, it's not worth as many yeah. uh, points. But he he wrote a letter to the principal, basically explaining uh, that of all the classes that he had taken, and he had taken the hardest classes that Lee Summit High School had to offer, um, but the, but choir was his hardest class. Hmm. And and you mentioned when you're talking about Einstein of like just the mysterious nature of it, and the reason he said it was so hard is he said because. Every other class I've taken, I figured it out right away. Hmm. I, with this, mm -hmm. I still haven't figured it out. Uh -huh. and, and I was like, yes, now we're getting it. Now, mm -hmm. like, that's what music is. I've been doing it now for, you know, 20 years as a profession, and I still haven't mm -hmm. figured it out, <laughs> you know. You're coming close, though, guys. Yeah. <laughs> You're coming close. I've heard your choirs. <laughs> well, but yes. in, in the choir, yeah, but a choir can sound wonderful. Um, but I, the way I look at it, I, I, I still feel like there's always something that I could do with it and I, a, a deeper place I could go. Uh, and that's why I love it so much. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, uh, there's still a, a connection that I could create with another human being the next time we put a choir together. There's still a, a kid's life that I could touch through it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you just never run out of things, mm -hmm. which I was going to ask, ask you about this next anyway, because I, um, I know that like once you retired, because I, I was a, a student at UMKC in your final years, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and then of course you, you kind of retired, but then not, and you've been active in you know, maybe interim uh, mm -hmm. pl collegiate places mm -hmm. here, here and there over the years. And um, what about getting up in front of the choir had kept you coming back? Uh, and doing these, you know, year-long stints at different places. Did you just love it too much? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't stop. Uh, mm -hmm. 
my wife now <laughs> keeps reminding me uh, about my singing. <laughs> I'm constantly making these sounds. I guess I, I wasn't really conscious of it until she kept pointing it out, but I, I keep um, singing these sounds kind of mumbling under my breath. And it's something I've done my whole life. I've, I've promised her I would really try to stop it because sometimes <laughs> it can get a little bit annoying. It's annoying to me, but I just know that uh, the music never stops. Uh -huh. It never seems to, it never seems to stop. I, but I, getting back to your, your teaching reminds me, I, I always told my students uh, to, well, those who are going to be teachers, to stop teaching music to people mm. and start teaching people through music. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what's missing. And I'm, I'm very concerned about with, with this COVID thing now that we are missing the point. Uh, it's not just being able to, to get into a recording studio and making sounds that other people can hear or uh, having a Zoom rehearsal but this, this thing we call ensemble, um, well, let's put it this way. When, when the group comes into the room, the first thing I usually say is ensemble is extremely important. Ensemble is so important because it is a reflection of life itself. There is a... Uh, there's a condition with the ensemble that you are doing something greater than you're able to do by yourself. And this is a demonstration to the rest of the community how the community is supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. um, we are supposed to learn how to work together, to not only move together and work together, but to think together and to feel together. Mm -hmm. And unless we are in touch with one another, uh, that, that's not going to happen. And that really concerns me. Yeah. Uh, wondering when this COVID thing is over, are we ever going to be able to bring people back again? Um, Especially if we're giving them all of these easier to package options. Uh, that's something I worry about too with, with kids. Um, if you're a parent of a kid during this time right now, um, of course, you're you're not likely given an option to put your kid in a choir because mm -hmm. of all the struck the challenges that choirs mm -hmm. have to face in order to get together, and so you're going to put your kid in something else that they can do. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to find something for, uh, for them, and usually with kids, once they get into an activity, they stick with that. Mm -hmm. So I think yes, I agree. I think there is an, a big issue, and it partly is a naivete. Um, among some of our colleagues that we could press pause on doing choir for a year mm -hmm. or two and then just pl press resume mm -hmm. and have everything go back to mm -hmm. what it was. In reality, people will leave. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll go find other things, horseback riding, tennis, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with any mm -hmm. of those things. But that ensemble, um, it, it, and it could be a bigger, a bigger issue than choral music, to be honest. It, it could be a societal issue where we're just kind of being encouraged very subtly uh, to separate mm -hmm. uh, and to not come together. And of course, there are health reasons for that. Uh, but my take, my take has always been, um, no, let's still get together, but let's figure out ways to do it the safest way possible. Mm -hmm. you know, be because I agree with you that it's not a frill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, get, getting people together mm -hmm. in, in the same space mm -hmm. um, even if it has to be a bigger space mm -hmm. where you can spread out mm -hmm. um, is not is is something you need for life. Mm -hmm. It is it is a um, a life giving thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've got students that are in emotional crisis mm -hmm. because they are not around their friends. Mm -hmm. um, that's not uh, selfish. Mm -hmm. Like that's you know that, that's mm -hmm. something people need. Uh, it's an interconnectivity. We are social creatures. So mm -hmm. yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, it, and and the good thing is there are places that are that see that mm -hmm. and you know like i said we've got uh singing is happening at my school but it sure looks a lot different we're spread out and mm -hmm. but it's amazing even with masks on and spread mm -hmm. out around the room the the healing energy mm -hmm. that the music provides mm -hmm. and the togetherness provides mm -hmm. is just so mm -hmm. important yeah. so important 
it kind of goes back to this bit about philosophy. Yeah. Um, the philosophy has to change. Uh, the philosophy, I think, for for music, with referring to the society itself, they consider it an entertainment. Mm -hmm. And of course, music is uh, extremely and can be extremely entertaining. But you see, I don't think that that is its original function. Mm -mm. It uh, it is so much more. It's a, a therapeutic. It's uh, uh, calms the restless, stimulates the lazy, and uh, we need to, as educators, bring that point across that music has so much more to offer than just as an entertainment. And as long as we teach it as entertainment, <clears throat> we're never really going to fully utilize its uh, potential. Mm -hmm. And even deeper, I would even say too, I'd add something to that, it's more than just entertainment. And like kind of back to what we were talking about earlier with methodology, it's more than just delivering information uh, too. So of course you get um, the, you know, this concept of we're using music to teach history. Or yes. we're using music to teach uh, the, the states of, in the union or you know, which all, you know, in a school setting oftentimes we see the value of that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, don't, I also don't think that's the original purpose either. I think it's mm -hmm. the stuff you've been talking about here with just, it's, it's, a, it's a way to connect um, and build empathy mm -hmm. between people. When, when I stand next to you and sing something, um, I, I'm sharing a, a very important vulnerability with you. You're sharing a very mm -hmm. important vulnerability with me. And it's an amazing experience that so many mm -hmm. people... Uh, get to have where they are in this ensemble with each other and all of the things that might uh, might divide them outside of the choral rehearsal room mm -hmm. uh, just don't seem to mm -hmm. uh, when they come together in the rehearsal. And that's, I, uh, it, it, man, that's got to be one of the things that we need the most right mm -hmm. now yeah. a, as, a, as a society. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about the philosophies that you, um, that resonate with you uh, you mentioned that going to a seminar or a workshop or something earlier in your life that that that, uh, that everything changed after mm -hmm. that. Could you remember? Uh, what, were there certain philosophies presented to you there that just caused a light bulb to go off? Yes, <clears throat> John Finney Williamson said, uh, "Look for what's not in the score." Mm. That was huge, because up until that time. I was following what I call the Robert Shaw, Roger Wagner philosophies, which was, which was constantly looking at the score and doing everything that the score says. Uh -huh. it, and that comes from the Stravinsky's philosophy because Stravinsky says, sing the right note at the right time and the music will take care of itself. <laughs> it, was, it was all technique. And here comes this man and uh, this was the last workshop he ever gave it. He was in his 80s. And he said, look for what's not in the score. And to me, that, uh, that opened up a whole new world. Um, uh, I gave a lecture, you know, at the AC Day Convention in, uh, in uh, Minneapolis uh, to, on, on church music mm -hmm. for the church choir people. And I think... Uh, I was trying to visualize some more, getting my philosophy in order, and I thought, you know, everybody knows this these um, this text from Philippians, which says, uh, "Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, is not rude." We all hear that at weddings, but I said, we never hear the last part of that, and the last part is, are there where there are prophecies, they will cease. Mm -hmm. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But these three may mean faith, hope, and love. So that got me to thinking, wow, if the earth burns up in a ball of fire and the universe collapses like a scroll, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. That must mean they are really important. Yeah. And they're pillars of eternity. So what are they, faith, hope, and love? Well, I can't hear them, I can't see them, I can't smell them, I can't taste them, I can't touch them. I cannot experience them with my ordinary senses, which makes them intangibles. Mm -hmm. And how can you convince somebody that intangibles are real? 
because, you know, some people will say, well, no, I don't believe in faith. That, that's no such thing. And you say, well, well, do you believe in hope? Well, sure, I hope, uh, I hope the Chiefs win and the Raiders <laughs> lose. You know? um, <clears throat> well, I'm thinking, and perhaps the Creator saw this in mankind, thinking they're going to have a difficult time understanding this concept of intangible. So let me give them something to bridge the gap between the tangible world and the intangible world. How about music? Mm. Music is something I can't see, I can't smell, I can't taste, I can't touch, but I can hear. And just because I can hear it, it makes it a tangible thing. Mm -hmm. It makes it real. But notice, it has four times more in common with the intangible than it does with the tangible. Mm -hmm. And that's its secret power. And I don't think society understands the power. Yes, they do understand the power, but they're abusing the power instead of mm. using the power. Yeah. So we have these noise inventors creating music designed specifically to bring out the worst in man. Noise, whereas noise we, inventors, I love that. <laughs> yeah, whereas you are yeah. uh, one of these people that is constantly introducing them, reintroducing them to the music, which is designed specifically to bring out the best in man. And that's what music educators should do. Mm -hmm. A very brief interruption to the conversation here to remind you that if you need digital sheet music to send out to your virtual students or your in-person students because you need to print something today and have it in front of them tomorrow, there are a couple sheet music vendors that affiliate with this show. And that's Ryan Main, who writes his own stuff and publishes his own stuff at ryanmain.com. And it's just excellent. My kids are doing two of his pieces right now and just loving them and loving every minute of it. So head on over to ryanmain.com and check out his stuff. And then there's Graphite Publishing. Graphite Publishing has awesome list of composers there and growing by the day of people who are publishing their music through Graphite. And it's an online platform. You're downloading the PDF immediately. You can print it out, send it out to your virtual students, all of the things that you would need in this technologically driven era, plus some just excellent music available at both of those places. So head on over to ryanmain.com and graphitepublishing.com to get some PDF sheet music and enter Coralosophy at checkout. You'll get 10% off your whole order there. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think there's a... Um, there's a little piece of that, like a, maybe a little bit, a little nugget, if you will, of that property that you just described inside of every really great piece of art and great piece of music. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and our job as a music educator is to help the students, help the singers find it. Yes. Um, and I think that that is a, a, an important and something that we're not really taught how to do uh, in our educator training because I don't know that it can necessarily be taught because the, the way um, it ha and this is maybe this is just as esoteric as you were being just a minute ago. Uh, but I think for me to teach someone else how to get to that nugget of, uh, of spiritual truth or of that nugget that makes people better, mm -hmm. right? Within each piece mm -hmm. of choral music, for example, um, I can help students find it because I'm helping them the way I know how to help them, because it's a piece of me helping them find a piece of themselves. I can't teach that to someone else. I can't teach someone else to use a piece of me to, mm -hmm. to help. Right. So each conductor, each music educator has to figure out what piece of them they can use Mm -hmm. to help their students, help their singers find that piece of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of ways, the way you described it, I love because there's this intangible, right? And, and this, this, that intangible connection, that piece of me that connects with a piece of my singers um, isn't tangible either. Mm -hmm. It's not a rope. It's not mm -hmm. a cord, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it happens through the music um, mm -hmm. and, and not in some kind of a mystical way, I don't think. Uh, I think it's more of just, it's, it's, a, it's kind of philosophical in a sense. It's their, um, the, the, the things that I'm uh, vulnerable with in front of my choirs become permission for them to be vulnerable back. And once mm -hmm. they open that mm -hmm. floodgate up and start singing together mm -hmm. is where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, yeah. you know, and I remember um, one of the things that, uh, I, one of the memories that I have from singing in your choir early on 
um, was an, an exercise, I don't know if you remember making us do this, but where we had to put on each other's shoes. Oh. <laughs> do, 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we, I, my memory of it was we went around to the outside of the room and we took off our shoes and then had to kind of mix up around and go around and find and pick find someone else's mm -hmm. shoes and walk around. And I think I picked some mm -hmm. woman's he, high heels or something mm -hmm. and walking around. Um, and of course, the metaphor to to experience life in each other's shoes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it was silly and fun and goofy, but it was uh, it was it impacted me because I had never really seen. Uh, well, let me put it this way. It was my first, one of my first collegiate choral experiences. And choir, as a kid in high school, in junior high, elementary school, I was just singing with the kids I grew up with in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and, and connecting with them was easier because I knew them. Mm -hmm. I, we knew mm -hmm. each other outside of choir. And, mm -hmm. and so that was really one of my first experiences, coming in to sing with people I didn't know from mm -hmm. from my other other part of my life, which is a totally different mm -hmm. experience, completely different experience, mm -hmm. and and that exercise just kind of, I think for me made me realize that mm -hmm. I, I was think I was kind of picturing okay if this was my high school choir doing this this would be like super goofy we wouldn't mm -hmm. even I, this would be no big deal mm -hmm. I, I wear Tim's mm -hmm. shoes all the time you know mm -hmm. that kind of a thing so anyway I I just thought I'd bring that up because I think that's partly what we're asking them to do and what we're helping people do when we when we do mm -hmm. music with with people is to find a connection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's very good chris you have learned a lot <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate uh, it yeah i was thinking when you were speaking earlier about how to teach um it's another thing i used to try to get these little catchphrases so that you use as few words as possible to deliver us Mm -hmm. Strong a message as you can, I'd say. Stop teaching and start sharing. Nobody likes to be taught, especially not Americans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, teach what? Well, that's when your selection of the music becomes primarily important because <clears throat> you let the music do the work for you. You get out the music with a, and it has to have a great text. People are always asking, you know, what uh, what is good music? Well, very simply, I've never seen a great piece of music with a cheap text. So you begin with the text. You have a really good text. What is a good text? It, it, it has to be thought-provoking, first of all. Mm -hmm. So you get a good text that's thought-provoking. You deliver that with the music to the student. Then you ask them, what does this mean to you? And you just keep asking, what does this mean to you? Mm -hmm. This last uh, semester, you know, when I was at the conservatory, I think students probably got a little bit weary. Every day I would ask, um, <clears throat> tell me, what is music? What is music? And little by little, they keep thinking about it. And every day I'd just have one or two people say what they thought. And everybody can be different and everybody can be right. But the idea is to get everybody to thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And the only way they'll think about it is by questioning. Yeah. And uh, another thing, I, I tell teachers when I'm doing a lecture, the first, thing, the first decision you have to make is, are you going to be a choir director or are you going to be a choral teacher or a music teacher? Mm -hmm. Because directors give direction, which teaches students how to be good followers. Right. But teachers stimulate thinking. They make people think for themselves, which develops good leaders. Well, how do you stimulate the thinking? Very simply, ask questions. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them how to do it. Ask them how it should be done. And to get everybody involved in that process. And so when you're looking at the score and you ask, what does this text mean to you? And you keep going and keep going, then it the very end, you can say, okay, let me summarize what you have said. That's when the teacher should give their own philosophy. Because the instant you give your philosophy, the thinking stops. Yep. They start following your, they're following mm -hmm. your thinking. And what you want them to do is think for themselves. But at the end, it's okay to summarize it. So at the end of the semester, I said, <clears throat> now let me understand Let's put together all that you have said about 
what music is, I think what you have said is that music is an image of heaven and earth in sound. Mm -hmm. Everything we can imagine about heaven and everything that exists on earth can be demonstrated through music. That's how powerful it is. Hmm. So. Yeah, now that's fascinating. And I, I, one of the things that about kind of zeroing in on asking questions in rehearsal, um, because I completely agree, uh, especially the part you said about uh, that if once you give your philosophy on whatever it is or your your view mm -hmm. as the director, uh, there will be a few uh, students that will, that might, if you have a good relationship, they might push back at you and say, no, well, I think it, but for the most part, no. they will just, that will become yes. the accepted, right? So a uh, save your opinion for the end, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really important. And that's really, really good. But can you give us some examples? Let's say, let's say somebody out there who maybe didn't grow up in a music environment or classroom environment where the director would ask a lot of questions and, and get that mm -hmm. kind of feedback. Or would these be questions about interpreting the poetry? Would they be questions about oh, uh, about why the composer would have written yes. this, these notes and rhythms? What do you feel like, yes. in your experience, gets the best response from people? Yes, yes, I understand. Um, the, the, you question everything. Um, uh, yeah. I, would, I would, very beginning, you, you have to begin with the text <clears throat> because the message is in the text. Yep. And uh, this was goes back to John Finley Williams in philosophy, look for what's not in the score. Mm -hmm. the, the message may not be evident, but you have to put the whole thing together. You come to the end of the sentence, then you know what the sentence is about. You come to the end of the piece, then you kind of have an idea what it's trying to say. And so you begin with the text. But then you can also ask um, uh, about the music itself. Say, uh, you... you you come to the end of a section, you stop, and you say, well, what's wrong with that? I think it was flat. Yes, it was flat. Uh, why is it flat? See, I have seen so many uh, directors <laughs> um, accuse the choir, you're, you're flat, you're flat, pitch it up, pitch it up, and they do all kinds of physical things and so on forth to, to raise the pitch. That is that's dealing with the symptom. It, it's not dealing with the cause. Mm -hmm. um, so many times when I've done festivals, <clears throat> say a three-day festival, people have asked, I noticed you never really said anything about the pitch when it was bad. Uh, you're right. Uh, because it's like beating a dead horse. <laughs> I can tell you, I can guarantee you that right after lunch is going to be the worst time. For pitch. I can guarantee you that the second day is not going to be as good as the first day. I, I can guarantee the second day after lunch is going to be absolutely the worst time uh, for, and for any rehearsal. They get used to your voice, they get used to the music, and everything starts to become a little boring. And you know, that's the big issue, boredom. You cannot afford to have any boredom. You know that old... Uh, Country tune Roger Williams used to sing, Pride is the chief cause in the decline of the numbers of husbands and wives. <laughs> well, I say, boredom is the chief cause in the decline of good intonation. <laughs> Absolutely. It, and uh, so, uh, so you, 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 you have to determine the cause. Sometimes you cannot control the cause. The temperature, it's too hot in the room. <clears throat> it's too stuffy. Yes, we just ate lunch. Everybody wants to take a nap. I'd like to take a nap. Um, but then you, then you work with something else. Um, I'm reminded of, can I, can I tell you something about, <clears throat> about a pitch thing? Absolutely. Which I just find yeah. very, very yeah. fascinating. Uh, I discovered it <clears throat> the first time when I was doing... New Mexico Allstate, New Mexico has an excellent Allstate. I've done it three or four times. And um, everything, was, everything was perfect. The room, the environment was perfect. The um, students had the music memorized. And we came in like second day after lunch. And we were doing Christus Factus Est of Bruckner. Eight pages, very chromatic, mm -hmm. eight parts. 
And um, okay, let's begin. And we sang, and I knew what was going to happen. We get to the end of the first page. I play the pitch on the piano. Flat. <laughs> I said, stop it. Stop it. Let's do it again. You know, got to the end of the first page. Flat. I said, who's doing it? Everybody looks was. Well, everybody's tired. Everyone wants to take a nap, you know, but this wakes them up. And I said, well, what? I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. <clears throat> we're going to start from the beginning. We're not going to use your voice. But you're going to do everything you normally do, except you will not phonate. So we're going to go along and add a certain chord. I'm going to hold it. Then I'm going to point at you and I'm going to say, sing your part. Or you, sing your part. I'm going to find out who it is that's going flat. Because it only takes one of you to sing flat to draw the rest of us down. Because mm -hmm. we're all conditioned to listen mm -hmm. from the outside in. Well, you can imagine how nervous everybody got. We started, and even as I was going along, I could stop and I would say, why aren't you singing? This person wasn't moving their lips. I said, you do everything you normally do except phonate. Let's do it again. We do it again. Tenors, no. Don't you see that key change there? Let's, let's observe that next time. It's doing. I kept that up, silent singing, for over 30 minutes. I can't tell you how long it was, but it was over 30 minutes because I thought, I'm going to keep this up as long as I have everybody's attention. Well, they were super locked in. Mm -hmm. Everybody anticipating, I'm going to point to them and make them sing, <laughs> which, of course, I never do. We get to the very end of this very chromatic piece. Uh -huh. Sing the last chord. They sing the chord, get on the piano. It's precisely in tune. Yep. <clears throat> They go absolutely crazy. It is so thrilling. Mm -hmm. and that was the first time I, uh, and I, that was fascinating to me because I was just experimenting. And then I have done it, I think, with every festival ever since. And it has always worked 100% of the time. So I say, you sing better when you don't use your voice. Yeah. I, I have this idea that the human brain will not accept anything but the correct pitch, if they know the music, if they know because it. they have to know yep. the mm -hmm. will not accept anything but the correct pitch unless it's interfered with from the outside. Now, I've always wanted to, I, I, I discovered this too late in my career, I always wanted a doctoral student to do some research on that to see if this is really true. But um, from then on, we could do a lot of silent rehearsal. Mm -hmm. uh, when I know that the voices are getting tired, now, instead of phonating and complaining to them because you're not singing up to par and singing in tune, let's just use our minds. And then the student that isn't seem to be locked in, they say, wait a minute, uh, what do you think singing is? Do you think it's about your voice? No, 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 it's not about your voice. That's just the end result. It's what you hear. I'm more concerned about what you are thinking and hearing on the inside than what you produce on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you yeah. absolutely, in fact, the, the, what you just described is in a lot of ways the basis of my teaching practice. Wonderful. <laughs> um, but we, I, we train, I train the kids from the beginning of ninth grade, to, the word we use is audiation. Ah, uh, there you go, yeah, um, of course. Where we can hear the music happening in our head. Uh, because what you're when you, in that experiment, I think I think what you were doing was you were forcing them to hear it in their head. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, if if given the opportunity, a young singer especially will, like you said, they will rely on what's coming from the outside in. Yeah, of course. And and so whether that be the piano in the rehearsal playing their notes for them, mm -hmm. which I won't let my kids do ever, though, so they always sing a cappella mm -hmm. uh, while they're learning because it forces the music to be here mm -hmm. first. And, and then out. And so I think you oh, yeah. had, had those doctoral students mm. done that research, they would have, mm. I think absolutely would have, would have worked. Mm. And so I'll do things like um, uh, where we start a piece at the beginning, we're audiating it, and I'll be, I, I tell the kids that I'm giving them a dead beat to keep the beat with just a small finger. Yes. But if I give them a big beat, they sing. Ah, and then I beautiful. go back to small beat. Oh, Chris. And we see great. if, you know, if four measures later, if we're all still in the same key, 
oh. then I know that we audiated correctly and they can hear oh. it then we're ready. Um, you know, so yes, that it absolutely works. Mm. And, and, and you're right because a lot of times the, if a choir is singing out of tune, uh, it's likely because they are singing in some vocally unhealthy or non, uh, non-conducive way that's driving the pitch down sure. and then the external source that other singers get is lower and it goes right but if they sure. all hear it in sure. their head then yeah it's, it's quite remarkable I'll have a very common experience for my kids is that we will play uh, we'll play a pitch once um, at the beginning of the rehearsal and 45 minutes later we're still in the same key and mm. um, <laughs> You know, and these are 16 year olds. They can, can, can I sing in your choir, Chris? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd love to sing in your choir. Yeah, it's pretty fun. It's yes. pretty fun. But you had to, and, and what's interesting is because I grew up in a generation of where the, the, um, the default was the piano plays in the rehearsal mm -hmm. and, we, and we respond. And, and I later on, uh, the, the story for me of how I switched to forced audiation was that I, uh, this was many, many years ago now, 12 or 13 uh, years ago. And uh, we had one accompanist to share. Uh -huh. uh, and typically we'd get a parent volunteer who could play and mm -hmm. would come in for the other group. But both groups would oftentimes have the, the notes being played. Well, there was one year uh, when uh, we couldn't find any volunteers. Mm -hmm. And of course, so the top group, they got the mm -hmm. accompanist. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I was on my own. And mm -hmm. I can't play. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it worked so, by default. Yes. Yeah, that's and good. by the end of the year... Those ninth and tenth graders, yes, they didn't they didn't have the beauty of, of tone of the older kids and the the you know the sophistication of the vocal production, but their intonation mm -hmm. was better, mm -hmm. um, even though they sounded mm -hmm. younger. They they were in tune because they mm -hmm. we went we had gone the whole year without having a keyboard playing our notes for us. Sure, sure. Um, and by the end of the year, I was like, I'm never going back. Yeah, right. I, like this <laughs> is so much better and easier for me as a director too. To just be able to play a pitch and then stand there that's and just great. yeah, you know. right. Um, great. And so yeah, no, it, it's absolutely right, and, and that's a, that's a really interesting thing. And what's cool about that too, um, it, we've kind of drifted away from the philosophy now into the methodology, but that's okay. Um, where it, there, I'll, I'll, I can bring it back into the philosophy. I think what's cool about that is that when my kids go through that process, they feel powerful. Mm, yes, the, the, of course. The music. Of course, when the music lives here and comes from them, the when the performance then is good, they feel like they did it. If the yes. music's always coming from outside mm -hmm. in, of course, then they just they're just um, moving moving head on stage. You know, they're not as involved. Um, so I think that's a, a really neat, sure. a really neat thing. They're, so they're um, becoming leaders yeah, instead of followers. Absolutely, that's the absolutely. whole point. Or yeah. just maybe even as a conductor, I might just walk off the stage and yeah. <laughs> you know, let them let them do it. Um, so let's let's shift to one more topic, um, or at least one more way of kind of talking through the the why of what we do. Um, you. Uh, like I mentioned, not, not to pick on your age at all, but I mentioned that you were That's an inter okay. inter you, you, you get old enough, you start getting <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. I was yeah. thinking about that where, uh, you know, uh, in a uh, completely uh, joking way, of course, I'm just goofing around, but uh, when I met you, it, it, as, as an 18-year-old, I was like, mm -hmm. There's, here's an old guy. Mm -hmm. And now here's me. I've got gray hair too, and and we're sitting here talking. <laughs> and I'm about older. Oh, sorry, yeah. That's right. Yes. Um, right. You know. So you've got you've had this perspective on our profession, our our choral mm -hmm. music world, our, uh, our the the world of music education, choral performance, all the things that you've been involved in um, over this intergenerational span. Um, what do you feel like? Um, First, if you could kind of go back to your earlier your, your earlier years and just maybe point out some things that you feel like have really changed, uh, that either for either for the for good or for bad. Oh, there are a lot of things that have changed for the better. Yeah. Uh, all you have to do is go to a convention today mm -hmm. and listen. The choirs are phenomenal, just so phenomenal. And uh, I remember that was certainly not the case. Uh, as far as my personal experience working with singers, uh, dramatic uh, change uh, you know, for the better. Uh, I remember doing some festivals when people would come and didn't have the music, didn't have the good organization, uh, didn't know the hows and the wheres, and it, it was a, sometimes it was a real embarrassment. And, <clears throat> but the, 
last few years, uh, every single Allstate is, and every state is outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even the local festivals uh, sound like Allstates used to years ago. So there's a tremendous improvement with regard to the performance level. But I'm not saying that's all good. Right. The fact that there's better performances is good, but the fact that too much emphasis is placed on just that, it's become, uh, it's become too sports-oriented, too competitive. Mm. Uh, if I had a say in it, I, I would do away with all contests. Uh, <clears throat> oh, you, you could still get together and sing for each other and you could sing for judges, but, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but to try to rate somebody and, and uh, uh, pick a winner. I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, pick yeah. a winner. That, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that to me is just, just diminishing what I think music really is. I agree, yeah. Uh, as far as, um, as what you people are facing today, I have no clue what direction it's going. Mm -hmm. But this concerned me a great deal that uh, we may lose the ensemble as it was intended to be, to be together. Uh, I already noticed a change in the last few years uh, with regard to <clears throat> what I could demand of the ensemble. I used to have this big thing about People shaking hands. You come in, you shake hands, and you, you, and then eventually you progress to hugging each other. And we were we were all huggers and handshakers, and that's a family I grew up in. But now you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Now we we're supposed to keep six feet away from each other. I mean, what is this going to do to the younger generation? Mm -hmm. What is this going to do? The philosophy of love your neighbors mm -hmm. when you can't even get close enough to look him in the eye. Yeah. So I'm concerned. I feel really, really sorry for you guys that are, that are trying to experiment with, uh, with how to negotiate forward. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the one thing that hasn't changed is music itself. Yeah. The philosophy of music and what it is, as Luther said, the greatest gift to mankind. So, uh, my age doesn't allow me to think forward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I only think backward. But I, I, I have seen this philosophy change from the '40s, prior to the recording, the advent of the recording industry. Prior to that. Uh, all of the great choral conductors were music educators. John Finney Williams and F. Milius Chris Johnson, Father Finn and the like. But once uh, we got these recordings, I saw young people with elementary kids tried to imitate uh, professional choirs, being professional. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> dealing with professionals is very different than dealing with them as an educator. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to, to go back to that philosophy of Aristotle and Plato, who said there has to be a balance between gymnastics and music. Um, too much gymnastics makes them ignorant and ignoble. Too much music, he says, makes them uh, neurotic and effeminate, but we don't need to go there. <laughs> uh, but what, what really, uh, what really surprised me is Aristotle said, he who listens too much, to too much ignoble music begins to take on an ignoble shape. And he who listens to the right kind of music becomes the right kind of person. Now, over 2,000 years ago, what kind of ignoble music could he have been thinking about? <laughs> but we can see it in our society. Mm -hmm. We can see what ignoble music does. And it, what it does to the young people who now try to imitate and emulate that which is ignoble. Mm -hmm. It could even be as simply defined as music that glorifies the way, uh, glorifies being the way you wouldn't want to be. 
Yeah, right. Um, which right. which does send, to, uh, and of course, because the way I think about that now is like, you know, there's music from lots of different cultures and lots of different places on the planet and lots of different languages and about lots of different subject matters. And the way I think of it is like any of those could be fair game and considered mm -hmm. to be noble music mm -hmm. um, if it's glorifying the way we would want to be. Mm -hmm. Like to, and to me, that that's beyond just art, that, or mm -hmm. beyond just music, that's art. You know, mm -hmm. is, is art meant to uh, show us what we could become mm -hmm. in, a, in a good way? Or is it push, you know, putting a, is it aspirational? Mm -hmm. um, or is it ignoble, as you, as you said? Mm -hmm. uh, is it something that we would want to avoid being? Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I agree. I think that, that um, you could find examples of aspirational and ignoble music in almost every yeah. corner of the world and every, yeah, in right. every part of history. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I think it would be interesting to know what, he, what kind of music he was talking about, though. Yeah, right. Uh, and, or to hear an example mm -hmm, <laughs> of, right. of ignoble music. Yeah, uh, but yeah no, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think that that's a, uh, an amazing... Uh, an amazing look back at just the historical context. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't want to keep you here all afternoon, although I could. Um, I just wanted to mention one more thing. Uh, yeah, just no. recently I had a, a gig in, uh, in Hawaii. Yeah. And there was a choir from China. And this was the first time a community group was permitted to leave China and actually perform in one of the United States. Wow. They couldn't come to the mainland, but they were able to come to Hawaii. Huh. And it was a large group, about 70, 60, 70 people, adults. And uh, <clears throat> they invited me to have dinner with them. And what was so astonishing to me was that being around those people, not one person spoke English. And I didn't speak Chinese. But during dinner, they were kind of celebrating different people's birthdays and anniversaries. And I noticed the, the, the response, their emotions with regard to each one of these items was absolutely identical mm -hmm. to me. Um, I noticed that in every way we were alike, except in language. Mm. But we all came together in music. Yep. We did sing our music together. And... <clears throat> It was um, something that connected me to the rest of the world, the far reaches of the world. I felt like we we are so alike yeah. on the inside, and uh, we need to we need to put on our blinders for what we see on the outside, and try to connect with what's on the inside. Mm -hmm. And music helps us do that. We were talking earlier in our, our conversation talking about that. Um, uh, that intangible mm -hmm. connection, and, and I think that uh, you know the, an appearance of a person, uh, a, a language that they speak, those are being you know those external things mm -hmm. that that in that intangible mu uh, property of music somehow can cut through, mm -hmm. um, and and it's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, so on on our way out, here's here's what I'd like to uh, to finish with, if it's okay. Um, you mentioned your, earlier that your, age, that your age doesn't allow you to look forward, but I'm going to ask you to exercise, that, <laughs> exercise that part of your mind. If you, um, if there was something that I didn't give you a chance to kind of to talk through that you you would really feel like would be beneficial to for you to kind of pass forward to the next generation of music educators, what would what would you what message would you leave with them? I, I think as teachers, some of the things that that are important as a teacher are you should be interested in everyone and everything. I could not stress that enough. Be interested in everyone and everything yes. because everyone is different and you need to be able to be in touch with everyone and their individualism as mm -hmm. you're teaching mm -hmm. and be interested in everything because that's a, a mind expansion. Every human being should be that way, interested in everything. And you know people who are not interested in anyone and anything, and they're very boring. Mm -hmm. But then there are individuals. And by the way, education has nothing to do with that. Yeah. I have a farmer who I knew as a child come and visit Kansas City uh, not too long ago. And I drove 
around and I, we drove by the Nelson Art Gallery and he said, what's, what's there? And I said, well, this is a museum of, of art. Well, can we go in there? And I knew that he knew nothing about art. And I said, well, yeah, if you want to. I took him in there and we would, <clears throat> I'd start pointing out a few things on a painting and I, my, I had a trouble getting him away from, from a certain paintings. I thought he was just absolutely interested in every detail and everything. And I thought, now this is the kind of interest we should promote, you know, among our students, be interested in everything and everyone. And then also to imagine that every waking moment is an adventure in living. <clears throat> so when the teacher walks into the room, they should come with this sense of adventure. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as I said, stop teaching, start sharing. You don't tell the students what they're supposed to learn. No, you just come in with your own enthusiasm, your own excitement, and you say, guess what? We are going to take this amazing journey today. We're going to go back 400 years. We're going to go, they call it the Baroque period, but that doesn't make any difference. Let's take this music and let's see what we have here. And that's why this early music is so adventuresome because we are a composite of everything that's happened before us. Mm -hmm. And so we need to tap into that little aspect. <clears throat> a little bit of the Renaissance still lives in all of us. It, it's less than the Baroque and a lot less than the Romantic, but a little bit of it, and it needs to be stimulated. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the Renaissance is kind of introspective music. It's calming music. It's music which teaches us how to pray. And the Baroque teaches us how to count. Well, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's totally different. And then the Romantic music, of course, we all relate to it very well because it's the closest to our age. And of course, the 20th century is teaching us too, but only you guys in the 21st century are going to figure out what it was. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> yes, you, you come in and you say, look at this piece. I cannot believe. And then you tell them what it does to you yeah. and the way it makes you feel and how it speaks to you. And then as you share your enthusiasm, it automatically catches on. They can't help but get yeah. inspired <laughs> by your enthusiasm. So you're not teaching, <clears throat> you're just sharing. You're demonstrating curiosity. Demonstrate, yeah, yeah, yeah. demonstrating curiosity. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Absolutely, that is just a fantastic, like I can't think of any better advice for a young teacher. So that's just a perfect, perfect way. You know, you know how we should finish this, Dr. Ely? How's that? We should finish this with a famous Dr. Ely handshake. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, isn't he a joy? So much wisdom, so much knowledge, uh, so much inspiration there. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of an episode. I always like to thank people at the end because, of course, this is long-form content. This, the whole point of a podcast is to do what we can't do on social media, on Facebook, when there's only a few characters that you can use to get across uh, what you're trying to communicate. So we have real conversations here, and sometimes they're over an hour. So I, what I love is that you can uh, play 20 minutes and then pause it and come back to where you left off. And so if you're sticking around to the end of these conversations, you are one of the diehards. And to show your appreciation, there are some things that I really need help with. As always, just a reminder, liking, sharing, leave a rating on the podcast app that you use, leave a rating on the Facebook page. Basically, these are any type of interaction that you can uh, sh give a shout out to the show helps other people see it, which means that I have to pay less dollars to the evil Facebook overlords to get to cut through their algorithm so that people can see the content. So it's very helpful when you do that. Plus, of course, you can help by heading over to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and shipping in $3 a month or more there just to say thanks and to be able to access the private podcast feed there. Then there's sightreadingfactory.com, graphitepublishing.com, ryanmain.com, mymusicfolders.com, and vocevista.com forward slash Coralosophy are all music vendors that are excellent products that can help you in the classroom with a variety of things. And at any of those websites, you can use Coralosophy at checkout to get a coupon code every time you make a purchase from one of those vendors. And then, of course, last but not least, Joining the, the Coralosophers Facebook page, the Coralosophy Con 2021 Facebook page, there are tons of ways to get in touch. We now have an addition at coralosophy.com on the main page where you can 
uh, leave responses that are off social media to an episode where you could say, hey, I'd like to come on the show and talk about something I heard on there. I'm not really sure how I'm going to put that together in the future. It could be some short segments of responses to previous episodes, or it could turn into its own episode. Just kind of depends. I'll take them case by case. Uh, and then there's also a way to sign up for a newsletter where I won't spam you just every two months. For those of you who don't check in on f- podcast feeds or Facebook all the time, uh, every two months, I'll send out an email saying, hey, here's who we've talked to in the last couple months. Here's the link to each of those episodes, almost like as a review of topics covered. So we've got a lot going on right now, uh, ways to keep the conversation going. And I appreciate you listening and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.